Good morning, and thank you for joining the ninth of a 10-part speaker series brought to you by the Maryland Clean Energy Center, connecting to the energy economy. Our topic this morning is advancing in energy innovation as an economic development strategy. My name is Kathy Magruder, and I'm the executive director of the Maryland Clean Energy Center. We have a lot to talk about this morning. This is a really key topic, and we have a great lineup of panelists. As we move forward, we'd like to engage the audience in some of the action here. So we're gonna do a quick poll um, and we're gonna ask you to respond just so that you know, uh, attendees are muted upon entry. The sessions will be recorded live and posted online at www.mdcleanenergy.org slash speaker series. Please check the chat box for technical support. Questions for the panelists can be submitted via the Q&A feature or by raising your hand during the discussion at the end of the presentation. Polling questions that we'll use will ask you to respond to by clicking on the radio button next to the answer that best suits you. Let's practice one real quickly. The first question helps us understand how many of you are with us. How many people are viewing the webinar with you today? And there again are the radio buttons. You can just click your answer. Shortly, the poll will close in about 20 seconds and we'll share the responses with you. This is our practice poll. There you go, everybody's by themselves today. Our second question helps us understand the audience, uh, who you are in the audience. Remember to click your answer at the radio button next to the question, help us understand the demographics of our audience this morning. The poll will close in about 20 seconds and we'll see the results. Lots of industry sectors represented this morning. Glad to have you. As I mentioned, this webinar is part of a, has been part of a series. We will be on our last webinar next week. The topic is the future of nuclear energy. We'll hope that you'll join us for the final session and you can view and hear recordings of the previous topic sessions online at www.mdcleanenergy.org slash speaker series. The session today is brought to you by our sponsors, Cone Resnick and the Maryland Energy Innovation Accelerator. Cone Resnick has been a series sponsor and we're delighted to have their um, representative, national partner, and renewable energy leader at the firm as our moderator today, Anton Cohen. Anton is a partner with the practice and serves as the national director of the firm's renewable energy industry practice. He has more than 20 years of experience serving closely held and publicly traded clients in a variety of industries, including energy, corporate and public tax credits, funds, technology, distribution, and manufacturing. He's experienced in private and public equity and debt offerings, capital structuring, and general business management. Anton's audit, tax, and business advisory services cover a wide spectrum of clients from startup entrepreneurs to multinational corporations. He is responsible for planning and supervising all aspects of a variety of engagements, which range from audit, tax, and accounting services to strategic and operational issue identification and resolution. Anton has also assisted clients with the conversion of US generally accepted accounting or GAAP principles to international financial reporting standards. He has prepared financial statements under IFRS. For the past nine years, Anton has been solely focused on building the firm's renewable energy industry practice his experience in renewables spans a wide range of technologies, including solar, wind, and biomass. He currently audits energy companies, funds, and projects, and he has been a board member of the Maryland Clean Energy Center. Good morning, Anton. Thank you. Good morning, Kathy. Much appreciated and uh, very, very excited um, to have this wonderful panel uh, join me on the call today. Um, we've got a wide range of expertise, and I'm sure there, all, your, all your questions um, certainly will be answered. Um, just to just add on a couple of things what Kathy said, for the last eight, eight, eight to ten years, I've, I've, I've uh, been leading the firm's renewable energy practice. Um, what I'm most excited about is, um, 
you know, is the fundamentals in renewables and clean energies are, are extremely strong. And, and, you know, what we've seen, um, you know, look, every, every business has, has been impacted by COVID-19. Um, but I think long term, um, renewables and clean energy um, have really strong uh, growth opportunities and fundamentals. And that's driven by not just the state renewable portfolio standards, but, but the large corporations that have, uh, you know, promised to be um, uh, emission free um, and reduce their carbon footprint um, at various points in time, as well as the fact that some of our, our clients, the large oil and gas companies are, you know, slowly transitioning um, into making large investments into renewables. So I'm very excited about the direction, not just of renewables, but clean energy um, as well. And, um, you know, what, what we're going to cover on the call today is we're going to discuss um, the roles that, that state entities can play in commercializing, advancing, and bringing um, some of these ideas from the R&D labs and the universities into the marketplace and where those resources come from, you know, whether it's public um, partnerships, um, other types of investments, um, and um, how to create, it's all about creating jobs. Um, and that's, that's, I think, important to everyone on this call as well. Um, how do we grow and, um, and create jobs as well? So, you know, we'll be talking about, you know, from a national perspective, what some of those innovations are, um, not just today, but where we see um, the clean innovations going. We'll talk specifically uh, about some of the states out there that have, have had a lot of success in this in the space, including Massachusetts and, and uh, Colorado. And then we got obviously a lot of experts here from Maryland um, that will you know, talk about you know, some of Maryland's programs and you know, where some of the best practices where we can um, you know, look at some of the other states and, and implement those strategies here in, uh, here in the state of Maryland. And one th quick thing I should mention before, um, before I forget, I mean, many of you might know this, um, but there, there was a, um, a proposed bill um, that was introduced bipartisan um, called the, the Energy Technology Transfer Act. And, um, you know, when you, when you, that was introduced, I think the bill was back in September, it was introduced um, by uh, Senator Chris Coons, a Democrat, um, and, uh, and Bill Cassidy, a Republican. And they, um, this is actually pretty, pretty exciting. It got a ton of bipartisan support and it's going to, um, you know, if you guys can research that bill um, online, I think the full bill is about 50, you know, 56, proposed bill is 56 pages. And uh, the idea here is that this legislation will help, you know, deploy clean energy innovations um, um, across, you know, across the country. Um, you know, we, we all talk about how the U.S. is a, is a world leader in, in energy research with, I think it's over 17 DOE-led lab, uh, labs. And, um, you know, we talk about re um, providing reliable, clean energy and access to, uh, to everyone in the future. And um, this will help bridge the gap between, you know, R&D um, and, um, and pulling, you know, a lot of these technologies um, into the market. And what's exciting is they're, they're national programs, they're regional programs. So, and I think this is essential as we, as we try to address, obviously, climate uh, crisis. So um, take a look at that bill when you, uh, the proposed bill, when you get a chance. It's, um, like I said, it got a lot of bipartisan support um, and there's some, a lot of specific programs and information out there. So I know that was a long introduction, but i um, certainly going to turn it over to uh, the rest of my esteemed panel here to, uh, to introduce themselves. And um, I think the good doctor is uh, going to kick us off here. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I am going to talk a little bit about myself. So I, I lead the uh, the technology to market function at ARPA-E. I'm going to talk mostly about ARPA-E. Um, bear with me. I imagine that a lot of the people on the line have heard of ARPA-E and maybe even interacted with ARPA-E. For those of you that haven't, I'll give kind of the dime summary of the agency. So we were established um, in 2007 and funded in 2009 under a, a, the, uh, the Recovery Act with our first investments. We're modeled on DARPA. So we have very broad remit, a very broad remit to develop, um, develop next-gen technologies, high-risk, high-reward technologies that align with our statutory mission, which is energy security, energy technology leadership, energy efficiency, and dealing with emissions associated with the, with the generation, distribution, and use of energy. <clears throat> Unlike DARPA, we don't have a built-in customer that pays for performance. We have to go out and compete in the marketplace as it exists. 
we have to go complete compete in the in the policy frameworks as it exists. So we have a group that I lead called Tech to Market, which is all about making sure that the technologies that we fund, even though they are leading edge sometimes, have a clear path forward um, to eventually achieve impact. So kind of circling back to what our what our statute is. Um, it gives us an incredible amount of latitude. And I think some of the questions down the line are gonna talk about some of the areas that we're investing in and where we see opportunities in the coming years. So I won't get into that too much right now, but we have program directors that put together focused programs. Those focused programs then um, lead to funding opportunities that fund specific project teams. Um, so I think it's worth noting at this point, before the, before the meeting, I pulled some numbers on how Maryland plugs into RPE. Maryland definitely punches above its weight in terms of in terms of engagement and success with the RPE funding process. Um, there are 26 current or former projects that are in the state of Maryland. Um, the University of Maryland is the third highest uh, recipient of uh, RPE awards behind MIT and Georgia Tech. Um, and Johns Hopkins has received, that's, that's a total of 16 awards. Johns Hopkins has received four awards. Um, and then the remainder are, are a smattering of small businesses. Um, and I think another thing that's maybe worth, worth noting here, I'm just kind of drawing on my personal experience with working with the University of Maryland in my capacity as an advisor to project teams. I'm aware of it. Well, three project teams that I've worked with have directly spun out companies from that and have tried to go and commercialize those, those technologies. Really interesting and innovative concepts um, that, that, are, that are trying to make that next step. Um, another award, another, uh, another project that I'm aware of in the Maryland system is one led by Eric Boxman that's come out in the battery space. So there's definitely a lot of cool stuff going on, supported by and within the RBE family in the state of Maryland. And those, uh, those projects are definitely trying to take those next steps into the commercialization space. And I'll save a lot of my thoughts on technologies for, for later on, but that's kind of where we plug in. Um, and just before I hand over the mic, we have about $400 million budget. The average project is about $3 million. So it's significant. Um, so award, getting these gives you a great opportunity. And the effort that we put into kind of commercializing and pushing these out the door, I think also is really, uh, really kind of increases the impact that these can have kind of at a state level and a in an economic development level. So I'll, I'll hand it over. Uh, Delegate Chief. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I'm really honored to join this uh, very distinguished panel and deep knowledge experts on clean energy issues and especially commercialization to advance our economic development. Uh, strategies. I'm mostly here to listen and learn, um, but want to start by uh, a quick self-introduction. I am a first-term state legislator in Maryland, uh, representing Montgomery County, and specifically the part of Montgomery County that is the epicenter of our state's life sciences corridor. So I am very much a, of a supporter of innovation economy. I personally came from economic development background uh, in recent years uh, for Montgomery County, uh, mostly focusing on the policy side of economic development. Specifically, I was involved in establishing a public-private partnership called the Biohealth Innovation, which is to advance commercialization and tech transfer to support early stage biotech companies um, so that they won't die in the valley of death. And that has been a tremendous uh, learning curve for me um, that educated me a lot about how innovation economy works and where government can play a very critical role, especially in the early stages of these great companies. Um, and I think the same principles can be applied to the clean energy sector. Um, this past session, I had the honor of working with Kathy and uh, MCEC, as well as the Maryland Energy Innovation um, Institute uh, to solidify and enhance the state's funding for both organizations um, so that we can be more aggressive in pursuing the opportunities. Um, the bill passed the, my committee, the Economic Matters Committee, but we didn't have enough time to advance on the House because of the pandemic. So I am going to reintroduce that legislation and I'm also preparing several other bills uh, to advance our innovation economy. Um, so that's the gist of it and that, uh, that's why I'm here and I'm very much looking forward to this panel. Thank you. Thank you, Delegate. Uh, Secretary Schultz. Uh, 
Thank you so much. I, I appreciate that. Um, I want to uh, welcome everybody first, uh, a virtual welcome to those that are here from outside of the state of Maryland. Uh, you can come and visit us in person at some point in time, so uh, and we, we can show you all the wonderful resources and assets that we do have. But um, I just want to say thank you for allowing the Department of Commerce to be a part of this wonderful conversation um, about economic future. Uh, for the past uh, several months, the Department of Commerce has been working to sustain businesses as opposed to what we typically do, which is, you know, to support and the expansion and the attraction of businesses. So this is a very welcome uh, relief to what we've been doing over the course of the last seven plus months. Um, but as far as, you know, innovation and supporting the growth of new technology, that really is what Maryland is all about. Um, and we love that Governor Hogan is fully supportive of, of what we do at Commerce and helps to lead the way. Uh, when he took office in 2015, we've been focusing heavily on supporting the business community. Um, and um, I, I think that's working. And I think people understand that, that Maryland really truly is open for business in many ways. Um, I will echo as to what Delegate G says and um, focusing on um, those innovative aspects of Maryland and, and this business community is something that we have been 100% um, full steam. In 2020, well, actually at the end of 2019 and going into the beginning of 2020, we were able to put together a program called Innovation Uncovered. And that is a real um, um, acknowledgement to the entrepreneurs, to those startup companies. Uh, we got a little sidetracked in March, so we weren't able to actually introduce what that program looked like. But in late July, we were able to put that out there. We have received um, over 100 applications um, and nominations for businesses to be featured as the governor's future uh, Maryland 20 businesses. And in November, the governor is going to be announcing who those businesses are. And the reason I say this is because there's all kinds of technology. Maryland is, of course, known for um, our wonderful biohealth and life sciences and cybersecurity types of technology. But we understand that there's so much technology and innovation in so many different areas that this is a way for us to be able to attract that. And um, we will be talking more about uh, biomass energy, about offshore wind. Uh, we have a big announcement today on offshore wind um, with a consortium. Um, but, but, it, but it's about being able to understand that the ecosystem of technology and innovation is much broader than what we typically think of um, in those types of innovative areas in Maryland. And this certainly is one of them. Um, so today, I know we're going to talk about it in a little while, but um, today it was released. I, I think at 1017, right when we jumped on to do a sound check, uh, the governor's office released, I, I don't know if it was on purpose or not, uh, but released a press release that uh, there is an MOU, um, a memorandum of understanding between Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina that was just um, signed in order to be able to put together um, a very concerted real um, regional effort in order to be able to see what our world looks like in Maryland and our surrounding and neighboring states um, to be able to attract these types of businesses here. Um, and I'm sure we're going to have lots of opportunities to continue to talk about that today. But thank you for having me. Thank you, Secretary. Uh, Troy, you're up next. Appreciate that, Anton. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, my name is Troy Lamel Stovall. I am the fairly new CEO and executive director of, of TEDCO. Uh, for those of you that may not know about TEDCO, uh, and actually in collaboration with the delegate and the secretary, um, we are Maryland's uh, arm for innovation and early stage innovation and investments. We do a combination of investments, early stage investments, which include both investments, traditional investments, as well as grants, uh, as well as what I like to call wraparound services that allow us to support those early stage uh, entrepreneurs and their teams and their growth and trying to understand their growth trajectory. And so through a number of those funds, uh, one of them is called the Maryland Innovation Initiative. MII, as it's called, for those of you that may not know about it, uh, is our uh, work with our five research institutions that we have here in Maryland. Uh, and through that, we are able to bring uh, many of our lab and the scientific research that happens in the lab and, and de-risk that and bring it to a point where it can be commercialized and invested in through not only other TEDCO investment vehicles, but also uh, commercial investment vehicles. And in that MII portfolio, currently we have about 15 uh, companies 
uh, through our uh, partnerships with the Maryland, uh, the, those five research institutions that are focused on uh, renewable and clean energies. And so we're very part, much part of this and we very much see uh, this particular sector a big part of what we wanna do going forward. I literally just got off a call with some folks on the Eastern shore uh, about some work that they're doing around uh, solar and aquaculture and, and agri-tech. And so this, we, we very much see this being a big part of what we do going forward and not just working with those five research institutions that I mentioned, but also looking at how we can leverage all the research, all the universities uh, and even the community colleges uh, here in the state of Maryland, because we just have some great, great resources. And that actually includes um, the federal labs. Uh, Maryland is blessed with, uh, the, with the largest number of federal labs and, and installations in, in the country. And so part of a, a big chunk of what we're going to be talking about is how do we partner uh, with, uh, with, with the good doctor that came on earlier and how do we find a way to bring some of that great research that's happening here in Maryland in our labs and our, our bases and commercialize that and bring that into uh, our economic development space. So I'm looking forward. I'm very honored to be on this panel today and I look forward to the, to the conversations. Thanks again, Anton. Thank you very much, Troy. Um, so now I'm going to sort of turn it, turn it over to the out of state uh, experts here. I think it's, um, it's always important to hear from um, other states and what they're doing um, and whether there's some best practices here. So we're uh, very excited to, um, to welcome uh, Governor Ritter, um, who is going to uh, introduce himself and uh, give us a, a brief overview. Thank you, Anton. Uh, my name is Bill Ritter. I presently direct the Center for the New Energy Economy at Colorado State University. Uh, prior to that, I was the governor of Colorado, and while I was the governor, made clean energy one of the pillars of my administration. So for four years, I signed 57 different clean energy bills, and I uh, did a variety of things to try and inspire not just not only just innovation, but economic development uh, in the clean energy space. And uh, when I left office, decided that the states have a lot of ability to move a clean energy agenda and make it an economic development agenda at the same time. So I went to CSU to work specifically with states. I have worked with a variety of states around the country with the governor's offices, with utilities, utility commissions. And then a few years ago, I began um, running a, a national legislators academy for clean energy. So we have legislators that come from around the country and go to this academy and basically we walk them through sort of the ability to pass clean energy policy at the state level. So we work with, you know, kind of all the stakeholders that are involved in that. Um, I've done a lot of work trying to help utilities think about how to get to zero carbon or net zero carbon, things that are now part of, you know, the climate caucus in the house has that, the Biden plan, should he be elected, includes uh, a target for the utility sector. So we're doing a variety of those kinds of things. And, and I'll just say my experience as governor is probably what helps me think about this the most when I think about innovation. And it really is about creating an ecosystem. Uh, we are lucky to have great research universities and that is part of the ecosystem in innovation and innovation in clean energy for us is that we had the School of Mines, University of Colorado, and my university where I am, Colorado State University, all three uh, were great research universities already developing a variety of different kinds of solutions and laboratories. But we also had the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. So we formed a collaboratory for them to work together on their innovations and to share their research and to build upon the things that they were doing and really collectively, hopefully, create different and good things. We funded that collaboratory with some state money. We don't have a lot of economic development money or clean energy money, but we found ways to fund that collaboratory. And um, later when there was ARA funding, because I governed during the Great Recession, we committed ARA funds to it as well, Recovery Act funds to that collaboratory. So that was certainly a part of it. But I would also say that as governor, I tried to make sure that every cabinet member of mine, no matter what discipline they represented in their you know, cabinet position, that every one of them bought into a clean energy agenda. And that when we did economic development calls, um, the head of the energy office was with them. When we did economic development calls, we had people from the cabinet from different disciplines who were all there to say to the companies that we were trying to lure here 
hey, this is the way we are committed to this across every discipline. And then finally, I'll just say, so we had money, we had you know technical expertise from the laboratories, we had a real ambition around that, but we also passed a lot of policies that helped people understand we were serious about being an innovation corridor. We were serious about clean energy and we kind of married those things. As I said, I passed 57 different bills. We, we had innovation happen, but we also lured big companies to Colorado. Vestas had never had a manufacturing site in the state of, or in the United States. It's a Danish company. It was the largest wind manufacturer at the time. And Vestas decided as a result of the things we'd done policy-wise, not because of any cash we put on the barrel head, but because of our, our policy designs that we were the place they wanted to locate. They, they built their first plant here. It was a wind blade manufacturing plant. Now they have all of their manufacturing in the United States, four different plants in Colorado. And you know, it's several thousand jobs. And for us, that was a really big thing. So there's innovation in policy, as well as technical innovation that can inspire entrepreneurs. And, and that's what I mean when I talk about an ecosystem. So thanks, Anton. I appreciate the opportunity to be here and uh, great to hear my fellow panelists as well. Appreciate that, Governor. Um, and last, certainly not least, um, coming from the snow in Massachusetts, uh, Mr. Pike. Terrific. Thank you, uh, Anton. Um, and thanks to Kathy and her team at, uh, at the Maryland uh, Clean Energy Center. Really appreciate the opportunity to uh, spread the gospel a little beyond um, uh, the borders of, of Massachusetts. So MassCEC uh, is a quasi-public <clears throat> agency that was created by the legislature uh, in Massachusetts back in 2008, really got up and running in 2009, 2010 or so. Uh, originally um, conceived as uh, primarily an economic development agency, as you could imagine, uh, as, as Governor Ritter just uh, mentioned, you know, coming out of the Great Recession, um, that was a, a primary focus of legislatures across uh, the country. And not unlike Colorado, uh, Massachusetts recognized clean energy as, um, as a, a potential strength of, of the state, not just uh, in those days, but, um, you know, for the decades uh, to come. That, um, that mission has evolved a bit um, over the last decade. We've become uh, equally focused now on uh, helping the state achieve uh, it's net zero by 2050 target, as well as uh, building, you know, continuing to build the, the state's clean energy um, economy. Uh, you know, the, the GHG focus uh, uh, was not um, uh, quite as well developed uh, 10 years ago as, as it is today. And, and you see that uh, across various parts of, of the United States. So we, um, we go about this in, in a couple of different ways, and, and um, I'll try to do this as quickly as possible, but we're really focused on four primary programmatic areas. And I don't think these will be, um, uh, you know, um, uh, particularly new or novel to uh, folks that, um, that are working in this area, but we know we have to tackle buildings. Certainly in the Northeast, <clears throat> that's a, a huge uh, GHG uh, contributor. In Massachusetts, it's roughly 27, 28 percent of um, of our GHG, so that's going to be a focus uh, over the next uh, uh, 10 to, to 30 years. Transportation, likewise, now in Massachusetts, over 40% of our GHG emissions come from transportation. And the, uh, the actual emissions have not changed literally at all since 1990. Our emissions today are the exact same that they were 30 years ago. So a lot of work to be done uh, in transportation. We need to continue greening our generation fleet. We've done a pretty good job of that over the last decade. Um, that's now down to roughly 18 to 20% or so of our, um, of our emissions, but we know we have a long way uh, to go there. For Massachusetts, uh, unlike, for instance, uh, Colorado, that means essentially offshore wind. Uh, that's really the only way we can do this at commercial scale. We'll continue uh, building out um, solar, but to do that in you know, in, in multi-megawatt, uh, never mind gigawatt uh, capacities is very difficult in a, in a state like uh, Massachusetts, same with, with land-based wind. And then lastly, 
The fourth focus area is that we don't have a grid right now that can do this. Um, our grid is completely incapable um, of handling um, all of the distributed generation, uh, all of the offshore wind. It doesn't, uh, it's not nearly flexible or dynamic enough to incorporate the levels of, of storage and the like that, that we're going to need. So we, we need a far more dynamic grid. A couple of other um, uh, areas that, that most probably don't think of as, um, as innovation and, and economic development, but we actually own and operate two assets as well, two physical assets. One is the Wind Technology Testing Center uh, that's just, uh, just outside of Boston. Um, and that is the only large blade testing facility uh, in North America. Uh, we've tested well over 40 uh, different blades, uh, now a number of them from Vestas, as a matter of fact, um, and uh, have tested blades up to 107 meters long, uh, the longest uh, blade in the world produced by GE. Um, our team just, uh, just finished up the testing protocol there. That's also a facility. Uh, that seven out of the eight last uh, of the preceding fiscal years has actually um, operated um, at a profit, if you can believe it. Um, an actual government-run facility of that sort um, that actually makes more money than, than it spends in, in a typical year. The second asset is uh, the New Bedford Marine Commerce Terminal, which uh, we completed five years ago. Uh, in the hopes that um, uh, Cape Wind, uh, an ill-fated offshore wind project, uh, was going to be built. But um, to this day, that facility is, is the only port facility in the United States that, is, uh, that has been purpose-built for offshore wind. I'm really glad to say that we have um, a couple of leases spread now over about four and a half years. Um, the first two uh, commercial uh, projects being built out of and for Massachusetts um, will be run through uh, through that facility. Um, and so generally speaking, you know, we go about this in, in really in three different ways. We go, we do market development and facilitation, we do technology development, we do workforce development, and, and we'll touch a bit on each of those um, a little later. We're funded, and I know this was of particular interest to Kathy, we're funded by a systems benefit charge on electricity usage in the state. Um, in ballpark, our budget has been between 25 and 75 million a year. That systems benefit charge brings in uh, right now low 20 millions or so. Um, it is, uh, it's, um, it's a relatively modest charge. Average residential customer in, in Massachusetts pays about 30 cents a month um, for that. A couple of um, just questions to ask on that. Um, does it make sense that it is on electricity when, um, from a policy perspective, what we're trying to do is move away from fossil fuels and towards electricity? Uh, a very fair question, but when it was created back in the late 90s, um, again, I, I don't think the, you know, the electrified future was, um, was top of mind for legislators. Um, so that's something to, you know, to consider for if, if Maryland is, is looking at something along those lines. Um, and then lastly, I, I, I would mention that um, uh, since our inception, um, MassDC has, has invested roughly $360 million. Um, that um, has been, uh, we've used that to leverage over $2 billion of, um, of government and private investment um, in the Commonwealth. Um, and when you look at that spread across our traditional deployment um, programs, um, that was roughly $4 for every dollar we invested. In our traditional innovation programs, $9 for every dollar um, that we invested. So um, I think a good example of, of how a couple of dollars of, of government funding can go a long way to, uh, to building um, you know, a much larger economic development platform. So I've, uh, I've probably gone on a little long, Anton and others, so my apologies for that, but wanted to give you an idea of, um, of what we're up to and, and what we're about. No, that was great. I appreciate it. And uh, I appreciate everyone's um, intros, not just about themselves, but about the different programs and uh, which we'll delve into in a little more detail. But maybe uh, turn it over to James um, here you know, at RPE. Um, James, as far as you know, what technologies you're, you're seeing, and obviously you're investing in a bunch, but... What are you most excited about, um, you know, you know, from a long-term perspective, and and maybe if you can just break it down a little bit from a from a national technology um, footprint as well as as Maryland, that'll be that'll be helpful. Right. Yeah. Okay. So I will. I'm gonna I'm gonna ad lib on this. I, I did 
kind of look through our portfolio to kind of see where things are headed. And, and I have some ideas, but um, by the way, before I go there, um, just a shout out to, to Bill and Steven. So Bill, Bill, Colorado punches well above its weight. <laughs> and, and, and of course, Massachusetts does, right? So, uh, so everybody, everybody here is representing a state that, uh, that, is, that is doing really well in terms of engaging with RPE and doing innovative research. Um, so in terms of, so I'm going to start kind of by, by maybe framing this first, first things first, what's specifically of relevance to Maryland versus kind of nationally of relevance. We, we don't, you know, we don't focus on geographies when we fund research and define programs, but some of our programs do naturally fit in certain geographies, right? So things that are going on at RPE right now that are of particular relevance to Maryland are things that need a coast. <laughs> so, um, so the, uh, the technologies that we're working on there that are of relevance, we, we have a program on, uh, on deep water floating uh, wind. So, uh, so this is certainly an area that is obviously of relevance to Massachusetts, less relevant to Colorado, highly relevant to Maryland. Um, and that's a program called Atlantis. And these guys are working on technologies that are basically trying to strip out, use controls and design improvements to strip out materials from these systems that just, the, the dominant cost in a floating offshore wind turbine is actually just the, the steel that builds it. And so that's what these guys are targeting. Another thing that we just recently started is a program called Sharks. And this is using the same general concept, but uh, in, terms of, in terms of the technical approach, but actually targeting that toward hydrokinetic um, and in particular tidal. And so there are some nice tidal resources that are um, in, I think that, like, between Ocean City and Assateague. I mean, you have, Part of this is on the environmental side too, making sure you know you don't kind of mess with fisheries and things like that, right? But uh, but that's another one that's certainly of relevance to Maryland. I think that, but taking a step back, I think the vast majority of these things are just they're just nationally relevant, right? So who, whoever innovates and sets up a capability, and really internationally relevant, whoever innovates sets up capabilities and establishes new businesses, new technologies, and new companies um, can take advantage of these, these national and global markets. Um, things that we're, that we're kind of launching now, um, we have a couple of programs in the, in the grid control space, in particular around basically trying to properly value intermittent resources so that they are properly compensated for capacity that they can generate for, uh, for utilities. Um, we are doing work in, in fission on next generation nuclear uh, um, O&M minimization. So basically looking at the system level for next gen nuclear and making sure that the costs associated with operating that system aren't too high. Um, we're working on, uh, on natural gas distribution, right? So natural gas is still out there. Those low pressure distribution lines are leaky as a sieve in some places and incredibly expensive to repair. And so we have a program. We, we, at RPE, for those of you that aren't familiar with RPE, we like to come up with cute acronyms for our programs. I have nothing to do with that. Um, but uh, but rep the, the natural gas repair acronym is repair. And it's all about basically robotically inspecting and repairing in place legacy natural gas distribution to avoid methane leaks, which is an, a, horrible, uh, a horrible greenhouse gas, right? Um, we're working in, uh, in, so I guess, so I guess another thing to kind of think about is like, where are the long-term kind of challenges, the, the hard pieces to get at? One of the things we're looking at is, is aviation, right? So decarbonization of aviation could come through biojet. So, you know, biological synthesis of fuels. It could also come through electrification and decarbonization of the base fuel for that electrification. And we have a couple of programs that are working on that. Um, we're working on fusion. I think that in your email earlier, Anton, you had uh, five to 10 years. I think that fusion is safely beyond that. Um, <laughs> but we are, we are active there. It's a long-term goal. But we, uh, we are looking at programs that are both improving the, the, the heat source, which is what most people that work on fusion do, and also programs that are once again looking at the system. So basically kind of building the fireplace for the fire so that when we figure out these fusion systems, how do we contain them? How do we extract energy? How do we make it safe? It's, it's, you know, it's far less uh, problematic than fission from a, from a waste product perspective, but it still does have its challenges with tritium generation, et cetera. Um, and the last thing I'll mention um, in terms of what we have going now is a program that I'm leading through the tech to market team called Scale Up. 
And so this is, you know, once again, talking about kind of getting things over the valley of death into the real world. The average, R the way ARPA-E generally formulates programs, we're funding things that are conceptual. Um, they make sense on paper. They don't violate the laws of physics. They don't obviously violate the laws of economics, but we don't know if they work yet. So we have to demonstrate them. The typical demonstration is bench scale. It's not sufficiently refined for the private sector to make an investment. So scale up is all about taking that next step of research, funding it with, through a combination of public and private funds to do much larger projects that can de-risk some of our most promising technologies and really kind of pave a way for private sector investors to come in and make, make the more substantial long, the more substantial next investments that they need to really scale manufacturing, start to do deployments, deployments. And, and a big part of this is just focused on taking concepts that work on the bench, turning them into products, putting them in the field and in the field, showing that they work in the real system, showing that they have potential for value and are reliable and really kind of quantifying that and de-risking further. And we've actually made two selections there. So we selected a program, a, a project, and, and, and we have more to come. So we'll have more to come around the end of the year. We've selected a project with a company out of California called Natron, uh, Natron Energies. They, but they're actually doing their commercialization in, uh, in Detroit, in Michigan, rather. Um, so they'll be scaling that technology in Michigan. And that's, you know, once again, about kind of the ecosystem and the resources available there versus in California from a manufacturing perspective. Um, and another one called uh, called Bridger Photonics, which is actually out of Bridger, Montana. And they are do doing uh, what's, what we call gas mapping LIDAR. So they, um, so Bill, I don't know if you know, uh, if you know Brian Wilson, you mentioned Collaboratory and CSU. And so, so uh, Bridger came out of Brian Wilson's program called Monitor, which was all about, uh, all about detecting and quantifying and pinpointing the location of methane leaks in the, nat in, the uh, in the oil and gas system. So that's what Bridger Photonics is working on. Um, so that's a lot, right? So I apologize for going on and on. Now, in terms of things that might hit in the next five to 10 years, there's actually an excellent program that was started by a, by a, a now professor at the University of Maryland called Ionics which is all about solid state electrolytes and membranes for and membranes and technologies for solid state batteries and lithium metal batteries. Um, and there are numerous projects that are coming out of that that are starting to raise funds that have a lot of promise in terms of improving energy density for energy, for battery storage, for, for incorporation into EVs, and then also into grid applications. Um, and another one that, that I'm, I'm just heaping praise on Paul, but another program that he started that I think is maybe kind of more on the 10 year time horizon is kind of looking at the next level of energy storage so that we can keep decarbonizing our energy sources. And this one's called DAYS. And it's all about 10 to 100 hour energy storage systems that are generally not battery based, but are really focused on just stripping all the cost you can out of these things so that you can, because when you, when you have longer energy, long duration storage, you cycle less frequently. So you have fewer transactions with which to kind of recoup your investment, right? So, um, so those are a couple of interesting areas that I think will be really helpful for, for just decarbonizing the grid, which is the first step in terms of kind of deep decarbonization of everything. Um, and so that's, that's a lot, right? So I, you guys can chew on that and react to it and I'll, I'll yield the floor here. <laughs> uh, and I appreciate and I appreciate that, uh, James. Um, I think it's always important for folks to hear what, uh, what type of technology is out there, what, what, uh, progress is being made, what stage they're in. So I think for the audience and just so everyone knows, I am, I have, we do have some questions. So, um, certainly we'll save some time at the, at the end of the day. Um, so, so Governor Ritter, I know, you know, we heard from Stephen earlier about sort of system benefit charge specifically to, you know, Colorado and, and, um, and, your, and your role over there. Um, wh where are you finding, where are you getting your funding from? Um, and then maybe spend some time talking about some of the programs you're most proud of that's, that's really creating sort of uh, not just, you know, economic growth, the jobs and, and, and some new technologies out there. I think, I think folks would love to hear that. Okay, well, thank you, Anton. And so, yes, James, uh, Dr. Brian Wilson uh, runs the Energy Institute at Colorado State University, and my policy shop is inside the Energy Institute. So we office next to each other, and he's one of those people that should win a MacArthur Fellowship with all of the things yeah. he's done in his professional career over his life to make such a dramatic difference um, in all of the work he's done. But uh, he and I are both on the board of a small 
solar company we developed in Rwanda together, mm, yeah. uh, trying to put uh, solar right now into refugee camps in Rwanda, but also trying to socialize it as something. So that's, that's Dr. Wilson. Um, Anton, the answer to your question is Colorado is kind of a tough place where budgets are concerned, but we have this taxpayer bill of rights. And so when I wanted to first fund the collaboratory and also to up the funding for the Colorado Energy Office to do the energy funding, we, we had to sort of find different places in the budget where there was some surplus. And that the first two years we did that, then we went into the Great Recession and the ARA funding helped us. When the ARA funding ran out, it was the universities that decided that this was well worth the money. It's kind of like, I think, Steve, you were able to talk about the bang for the buck on different dollars spent this collaboratory, which is one of the things I've already mentioned, but also one of the things I'm most proud of, uh, really had a, a major economic impact in terms of the money returned for the money that we put into it in the research projects, but also the research that came out of the, the different universities and then over time was commercialized. We also developed a Colorado Clean Energy, um, I have to think of the acronym, but it's, a, but it's basically a not-for-profit that allows small companies to sort of gather and say, what are the kinds of things we need to do to ensure that we have commercial viability? viability? And I don't know if you guys know about a thing called Techstars. It was started first in Boulder, Colorado, and it partners with startups to try and help them through, as you said, uh, Delegate, as you said, the, the valley of death. It helps them through that. And now Techstars is in 38 places around the country, but we have uh, sustainable startups that uh, are partnered with Techstars. The Nature Conservancy has a program that partners with them, and we have a variety of other clean energy sort of technical startups that have been part of the Techstars model. And, and that really has helped us with, again, commercial viability. What's really interesting about this is that has also attracted venture capital money. So when you talk about this, Anton, not a lot of government money goes in and in part that's because of this taxpayer bill of rights, yeah. but there have been some things that we've been able to do to inspire you know, the first couple of steps. And that in turn has attracted different kinds of VC money. And I, you know, there's a way to map this out. We're, we certainly were not one of the biggest VC states in 2006, um, but we've grown that and grown those opportunities in a significant enough way that you can see sort of, again, the entrepreneurial spirit uh, move into Colorado in a, in a different way than it was in Colorado. Now, uh, Boulder, Fort Collins, and Denver are three of the leading software companies uh, that we have per capita uh, more software engineers than other cities in the in the country, and, and the reason that's important is because um, James, while you know you talked about decarbonizing the grid, I think there's a lot of heavy hardware that's going to be a part of decarbonizing the grid, and certainly building out the grid, like Stephen talked about, in a bigger way is important. But a lot of that's going to be software as well. A lot of it's going to be creating platforms that speak to each other, and and you know are two way from the home or the business back to the utility and vice versa. And, and so for us in Colorado, I think that's a big part of that entrepreneurial edge that we have is thinking about how to build those kinds of platforms that are gonna over time uh, decarbonize the grid. Awesome, thank you for, thank you for that, Governor. Um, Steven, you mentioned a little bit earlier about sort of workforce development needs and some of the programs you have in place there from a, from a job creation standpoint. Um, maybe maybe spend a little bit of time uh, specifically in Massachusetts and discussing the different programs or some of the most successful programs you have out there on sort of creating innovation and also workforce development. At least once a webinar, I forget to uh, unmute myself. Um, so uh, yeah, thanks, Anton. Um, yeah, I'll touch real quickly on, on some of our technology development um, efforts because I, I think it... Um, it dovetails quite nicely with the ecosystem uh, concept that both uh, James and, and the governor have referred to. Um, and Massachusetts, of course, given um, uh, you know the density of, in particular, uh, academic institutions and um, uh, and the like, uh, is very focused on uh, continuing to grow its innovation economy. And what we've done, and, and again, uh, Delicate G and, and others have talked about, you know, commercialization valley uh, valleys of death and the like, is we've tried to 
identify where there are gaps within that innovation ecosystem um, where again relatively modest um, amount of funding can you know can really go a long way and so we have um, a suite of three different technology uh, development programs that provide uh, funding directly to innovators, be they academic or in the business community. One is to uh, help them develop prototypes. Again, pretty modest funding up to $65,000 uh, per grant. Another is actually a, a direct product of conversations years ago with ARPA-E, um, which is to provide matching funding um, to applicants to primarily federal programs, but also uh, foundations and, and the like. RPE is, is one of the leading um, partners in, in that program. That's, um, uh, that can be up to roughly a quarter million dollars. And then we have a third, um, which gets to uh, sort of one of the program ideas that James was talking about, which is um, how do we uh, help companies demonstrate their product um, in the market in um, a uh, in an actual business environment so that they can attract that third party funding. Um, that's usually a spot where um, private investors are, are not willing to go. Um, and we so we provide um, we provide again up to about a quarter million dollars um, there. We also have a couple programs that uh, indirect support to innovators. Again, this ecosystem concept. So we support accelerators, um, organizations like Techstars, um, Governor, or in our case, um, Clean Tech Open Northeast or Mass Challenge, um, which has gone not just national but international. We also support incubators. Um, so while the accelerators are more of a boot camp type of um, one-shot deal for uh, for companies, uh, the incubator is an actual physical space where they typically reside for anywhere from a year to five years or what have you. The best example of that is Greentown Labs, which is the largest uh, uh, clean tech and climate tech incubator in uh, in the United States. They have roughly um, about 80 to 90 companies there right now with another 10 to 20 uh, partners um, housed in their facility. So those are a couple of ways that we go about it. We also have uh, and again, the governor was just referring to venture capital. We actually do venture capital, believe it or not. Um, we have a different priorities from your typical venture capital organization, but we do make um, s uh, everywhere from seed to series A to series B equity investments directly um, in companies. And so this is all an effort of of trying to create this, uh, this innovation ecosystem. As far as workforce is concerned, um, uh, workforce net, well, not now, um, of course, after the last eight or nine months. But um, in our last report last year, over 100,000, uh, over 111,000 workers in Massachusetts. That number has increased um, every year over the last decade. Um, aggregate increase of uh, nearly 90 percent um, since 2010. Um, so really, some terrific progress in Massachusetts. A particularly successful program, and and one that is, I think, most beneficial for. Um, for the innovation economy is a college internship program um, that we fund. It's now over 4,000 uh, college internships to uh, over 400, uh, it's, I think it's 60, 70 different companies in Massachusetts. 90% um, of those companies um, uh, are, uh, are um, smaller than 50 employees. And uh, I believe it's roughly 80% are smaller than 10. So really focused on very small companies. Those are the companies that find that program to be particularly um, beneficial. I think in the future, what we'll look at are um, buildings. I mean, if we're going to essentially retrofit all two and a half million buildings in Massachusetts, we're gonna need a much larger workforce um, than we currently have to do that, a much better trained workforce. We're also gonna um, need to figure out how um, to uh, really uh, train up the operators of our commercial buildings. You can have all the technology in the world uh, in it, but if the operator doesn't know how to use that technology, they're going to override it. Um, they're not going to understand it. It's not going to be um, optimized. The second area is um, is offshore wind. Um, that is, it's obviously Maryland very focused on this as well. Really, a once in a lifetime opportunity to uh, create a whole new industry in the U.S. So we're really focused on that. We've We've put about two and a half million dollars in over the last four years. The, the vast bulk of that, two million in the, really in the last 18 months, 
developing the infrastructure, both from a curriculum standpoint, as well as from a physical infrastructure standpoint, um, uh, the, um, the, the, uh, the capacity to start to train people. And we're just starting to train people to, to work in that industry. The last area of focus on, on workforce for us will be doing a better job of spreading the benefit of these jobs across all demographics. That internship program that I mentioned has done a decent job of that. Over 60% of the internships go to uh, women um, or minority um, applicants. So some progress there, um, uh, but that, isn't, that hasn't been the case across all, all of our programs. And, and that's an area that we're gonna be very focused on in, in the coming years. Uh, that was great. Thank you. I appreciate that. So, so, so we're turning it over to uh, our Maryland contingent here. Um, so, you know, Troy and, and um, Delegate G and Secretary Schultz, you obviously have heard, um, you know, heard from different states here and obviously RPE. Um, for, you know, for the folks listening in, you know, maybe spend some time talking about um, the different programs that uh, you have in place to create some of this economic development and, and innovation in Maryland. And, um, and maybe also listening to, you know, some of the other speakers here, maybe some of the things that, that maybe Maryland can, can take away and, 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 and focus on um, to create even, uh, even, even better sort of deployment of, of some of these uh, innovative technologies. So whoever wants to take it uh, on from the Maryland side that uh, can, can kick well, it off. Well, I guess I'll, I'll, I'll kick it off, but I know that my other two partners in Maryland probably have some wonderful things to say as well. So I won't take up uh, too much time, but but I want to just respond to what I've heard, and I've heard that you know the way that um, good successful beginnings of these types of business ventures in other parts of the country come from collaboration, and so I just want to be able to identify you know all of our collaborative efforts that we've had, and thanks to MCEC you know here today pulling this together to be able to give an opportunity to talk about it. You're going to hear from Troy at TEDCO in just a minute. And TEDCO and Department of Commerce have never been closer. Uh, TEDCO is a, a quasi-governmental entity where commerce is the official economic development entity for the state. But also, um, I was for four years the secretary of the Department of Labor, which did all workforce development in the state. So our ties to workforce development is so close. And we can't do anything in the state without our partners, especially in this in, in this um, this realm, uh, with our Maryland Energy Administration and our department, uh, our friends at the Department of the Environment and the Department of Natural Resources. So, we have in Maryland what we call a commerce sub cabinet, which is basically um, members of the governor's cabinet that have anything to do with economic development. And we get together routinely, and all of our staffs get together routinely, which is sometimes, as you know, even more important than us getting together routinely, so that we can share what those projects are, those ideas out there amongst all of the different um, agencies that might have something to do with the advancement of an ecosystem. And that works really, really well. And uh, something that has not been done before. And to be able to get our teams together talking about something like pulling together the offshore wind MOU that was just released today, uh, that multi-state um, pact, and to be able to look at different things when it comes to our ports, for example, working with the Department of Transportation, understanding the importance of the, the Port Authority when it comes to uh, many of these projects working with our friends at the Department of Natural Resource to talk about something that's really important for Maryland, which is biomass energy um, and the control of our forestries um, in, in the state and how important that is to the health and well-being of the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so all of these agencies work together um, in order to be able to come up with, you know, really concrete um, administration-wide um, solutions. To, to what we think has been um, areas in which we could not um, advance into, into the different areas. Some of it legislatively, I, I'll, I'll just admit, I am also a recovering legislator. So I admire Delegate G uh, for her work in the legislature and being able to try to you know, promote good quality uh, programs because even when I was in the legislature, you realize that because some things are about energy, they're also about economic development. They're also about advancement of the economy. Um, and in many times, um, in the case of biomass energy, for example, in those parts of the state where you typically don't have high dollar jobs, uh, when we're talking about some of our rural communities and being able to bring 
um, some of these programs out to the Eastern Shore, for example, or to Western Maryland and us losing, you know, a big biomass with, with Verso closing down in Allegheny County um, last year, wanting to be able to make sure that we can address those, those needs geographically and demographically as well. Um, there are specific programs. You know, we have tax programs, tax credit programs that, you know, we can help. From what I hear from companies, though, it's not always about the tax credit. It's not always about that. It's, the be, it's being able to connect to other types of resources that, that are valuable, being able to understand where the researchers are, uh, being able to understand where the workforce is, being able to understand, you know, where some of the major assets that we have in, in the state and how we can continue to, to connect them. And that's where I think the ecosystem gets its, um, gets its start and uh, hopefully begins to grow as quickly as some of the other states as well. Thank you. Much appreciated. I'll um, I'll jump in. Um, uh, appreciate uh, Kelly's comments. Matter of fact, her, her comment about closeness is uh, she sits on our board or my board, and uh, she helped hire me here recently. So I'm very appreciative of that. And but she's right. Uh, she and I have talked a lot about in these last few weeks that I've been here about how commerce and Tedco can work. I mentioned um, a few moments ago the Maryland Innovation Initiative (MII). I want to spend a minute on that because I think that is one of the tools that we do have. Uh, to help generate it. And I think it sounds a lot of what, what I've heard in Colorado and Massachusetts as far as what they're doing. Uh, so the Maryland Innovation Initiative is an effort across our five research institutions here in Maryland. And those five research institutions are Johns Hopkins, which I'm sure many of you are aware of, uh, College Park, University, University of Maryland at College Park, University of Maryland, Baltimore, University of Maryland, uh, Baltimore County, and then Morgan State University, which is an HBCU uh, in Baltimore. And so and I, I want to I'll spend a minute on that because that ties to, I think, Stephen's comment about workforce. So I'll, I'll come back to that. And so what we do is we, we are that bridge between um, the, the research efforts when those research dollars kind of end and how do we start to de-risk that technology, start to think about the commercialization, capital, applicability of that, uh, and then provide initially grants. And our goal is to use those grants to lead to investment vehicles. And we have other investment vehicles at uh, TEDCO, one of them being a Maryland venture fund, which allows us to invest in early stage investments up to a, a, almost a million dollars. And so we have a range of vehicles and also a range of support services. So it's not just um, providing them monies. Uh, we also provide support services. We have these individuals called site miners at those five campuses that I just mentioned. And their job is to really to help work with those researchers, work with those scientists, and frankly, turn them into business folks and to start to have them think about the commercial viability of, of what they're doing and help them understand that, that those technologies and how that, can, uh, how that can come to market. And as I mentioned a few moments ago, because of that work, we have about 15 in our portfolio currently. Uh, several of them are actually moving towards, actually moving from grants and, and kind of concepts from labs into moving in and, and eventually hopefully getting monies from one of our other uh, Maryland venture fund uh, funds. And so that's the type of, of model that we have put together here in Maryland. Uh, and as I also mentioned, we're looking to expand that. I mean, for right now, I'm calling it uh, MII version two. Somebody will come up with a better name on my team. But the goal is to reach beyond just those five research institutions to reach all of our institutions of higher learning, including our community colleges here in Maryland. I believe is that, uh, that, that um, uh, there you go. But I believe is that, <laughs> there you go, Anton. I believe is that, uh, that, um, that entrepreneurship and creativity exists beyond, not just at those five, but beyond, beyond those five. And, and I just wanna really quickly mention to Steve, on Stephen's point about the, uh, the workforce. And I know we had and kind of in our pre-talk about this. Look, I'm an investor, uh, but I've also been, my, in one of my previous lives, I, I've worked at uh, four HBCUs and, and had a consultancy to a lot of them. And so this notion of, and I saw a, a question in the chat about this, we, we have to make sure that as we think about these investments in, in, in these clean energy, that we're thinking through um, the workforce, because it doesn't matter if I've got a great investment, if I don't have somebody that's gonna actually do the work associated with that, uh, we then, then our investment won't really make any difference. It doesn't matter if they're able to lower greenhouse gases tremendously, if we can't have a, a, a individuals, and I say that plurally, um, that can know how to do that work and how to do that. And so this, this effort is not, we're talking here about the investments and the roles, but I think one of the things that states are gonna to have to think about is how do they begin to rethink and recalibrate uh, the training that's happening 
and it's not always going to be a four-year type of, 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 of pathway. It could be, uh, it might even be a two-year pathway. They're going to be things like credentials and micro badges that have to be thought through uh, because back to this notion of an ecosystem, we've got to think not just about these investments in the technology, but we also have to have a parallel path around how we bring a level of inclusivity into this, as I think Stephen mentioned, uh, but also rethinking that educational pipeline that's going to produce those individuals. Thank you very much, Troy. And, and here at the beginning of the of the panel, I thought my dog would interrupt us and happen to be my wife. So, you know, it's uh, that 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 uh, that happens. Um, so you you know, just want to maybe a couple of questions came through and, and I know we talked about this um, on our, one of our prep calls here and, and we, you know, Kathy, we had talked about doing a separate panel specifically on this topic because I know a lot of us here are passionate about this, but this question is for everyone. And, um, and uh, maybe Troy, you could kick this off, but it says, could you talk about policies and examples that increase economic opportunity and jobs specifically for communities that have been underinvested in, particularly BIPOC communities and, com and low-income communities. How do we make sure these investments and programs are increasing economic opportunities for those who need them the most? I know there's a lot in there, and there's yeah, and, yeah. and we talked about there's a lot of discussion topics, but it's very important, I think, for everyone here to touch to talk about this. It is, and I don't pretend to be a policy person. I'll, I'll leave that to, to the delegate and, and my friend Secretary Schultz on, on policy stuff. I don't pretend to be a policy guy, mm -hmm. um, but I, as I mentioned just a few moments ago, I do understand uh, educational pipelines. Uh, I do understand, you know, that the the legacy um, these these legacy plants have many times been put into rural or communities of lower income individuals. Um, and then they have been, in many cases, uh, disenfranchised out of these, these growth opportunities. And so um, I'm very, as you can tell, I'm very passionate about that there has to be a rethinking of these, of these educational pathways that lead to these, 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 these new jobs. And so um, that probably is part of the policy and the funding, but uh, that means a partnership and an understanding of, of the role that the community colleges could play. I think that's gonna not part of the, at the table. We tend to always wanna go straight to the four-year institutions. I think there's a huge role for the community colleges to play in developing this and reaching those populations that have traditionally been underrepresented um, and even working still with the four-year institutions for them to rethink uh, their economic pathways that may not always lead to a four-year degree. Uh, it could lead to other types of badging and credentials. There's a language thing that we have to introduce into our educational systems so that we have a different way to uh, get at and access this, this talent base, uh, but also think about where we place these, these, these various new uh, industries, whether they're solar farms or battery, battery technologies, where are they gonna be physically placed? That also has to be part of the conversation and make sure they're accessible to, to these populations. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just I'll just add on to that, and I and I totally agree um, with with everything that Troy had said, and I'm sure everybody uh, I don't think anyone would disagree with that. And it's all about the specific programs. I think you know being able to have um, really that solid pathway and the intentionalism of moving forward with that type of um, uh, a broad level entry level sometimes type of a a way to move forward. Maryland started in 2015 um, something called the Earn Program. Employment Advancement Right Now. Uh, Sabrina, Sabrina, I can get you that link, but it's Employment Advancement Right Now. And what that is, it's a series of dozens of training programs that are put together by either community colleges, um, nonprofit organizations, um, or industry-specific associations. Um, and they have trained thousands of individuals um, and in order to be able to qualify for most of these types of opportunities um, through state workforce funds. Um, and these are, um, as uh, Governor Ritter will know, there's a big difference between state workforce funds and federal workforce funds. Federal workforce funds, you have a very, very limited capability of being able to provide training in areas that you actually need it. <laughs> um, if we're using state funds, the governor has put in at least $5 million a year into these very specific training programs where they are mostly certificate-based programs. And not only are they doing the training, but they're connected with at least 10 private owned businesses that are sponsoring those training programs as well for the hiring of the individuals that are coming out. So you have a direct pathway 
um, for these individuals that are in disadvantaged parts of the state in different, um, in different demographics in order to be able to have that constant flow. What we need more of is we need more dollars in order to be able to concentrate on more types of training. And Maryland is atypical in the fact that most states rely only on their federal funds in order to be able to do workforce training. So um, I, I think that's a way to go. Also incentivizing what has been able to done, been, do, been done in areas like opportunity zones, uh, being able to maximize the investment of those um, venture capitalists and those that are working to put capital in those opportunity zones to be able to make sure like in Maryland, what we were able to do is we were able to stack our existing state Senate incentives into those opportunity zones. So if they were getting a Maryland incentive, then thanks to the likes of our legislature, like Delegate G, we were able to increase the significance of that incentive because it was in those opportunity zones which have been designated to be areas. Um, so there's lots of policy decisions that can be made. Um, focusing on that um, is, is part, I know, of building the ecosystem. I would, right. I would also just add in terms of specific policies, um, if we're talking about you know, trying to uh, create wealth in communities of color and marginalized communities, energy efficiency programs are one of the most important things to look at, both from the retrofit side, like Steve was talking about, but also from the appliance side. There are a lot of buildings with old, old appliances that are terribly energy inefficient. You can make a real difference in modernizing those appliances for the carbon footprint. And then just in the variety of ways that you take an old building and retrofit it so that it's more energy efficient, uh, both from the insulation perspective and the lighting perspective. What's going to happen, I think there's a, a very good possibility, and it depends on the political makeup starting in 2021, but there could be a massive infusion on the part of um, on the part of the federal government in a stimulus package that if there is, it will have a lot of money there for this kind of a program. And it's really important for states to take this and to administ administer it well. The environmental justice movement that is out there and that's been you know out there for a long time, um, it's interesting. They, they don't want utilities to think just about affordability. They want them to think about the workforces Maryland has done a very good job of, but also about wealth creation inside of communities. And so I think it's important to do well-designed energy efficiency programs, well-designed appliance and retrofit programs that actually find ways for companies that are minority owned to create wealth inside of communities of color. Hey, Anton, can I just jump in? Just yeah, sure, just absolutely. You know, I'm, um, I'm, uh, I didn't say this on my intro, I'm an engineer, uh, computer scientist by, by training, uh, but I, I've fallen in love with words, Governor. And, 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 and so I, I say that to say, uh, I hear you on the wealth creation, but I actually would, I want to push, and I've been, as Delegate Chi knows, I'm pushing this even in our conversation in Maryland, a different language. As opposed to saying wealth creation, we need to be talking about wealth expansion and wealth inclusion. Uh, because if, if it's just wealth creation, many times that conversation kind of alludes to, frankly, those who are already wealthy getting wealthier. But if we're more intentional, I think Kelly used the word, and I think that's right. It's, we have to be more intentional. That means even with our words that we have to be talking about how we include and expand those that are a part of this wealth of, of, of creating that wealth. Um, since I heard my name mentioned several times, I thought I would <laughs> jumping as well. Um, I'm so thrilled to see this very robust discussion. Um, in fact, I would like to address a couple of uh, questions together if I could. Um, one was the previous question about Maryland's strategies. I think um, after hearing all these great practices and the policies and programs, I think what our state needs right now is some clarity for the community in the clean energy space to understand where they can go to get funding, where they can go to get assistance. And I see my role as legislator and as the, the government in general is to support the work of uh, um, uh, Troy's work, you know, uh, Secretary Schultz's work so that they, to, in, to enable them and to enable our entrepreneurs. Um, for example, you know, we are already a national leader uh, in our R&D uh, per capita spending. In fact, Maryland ranks number one in the nation in our spending on R&D. Um, and yet, uh, vast majority, 85% of that funding uh, goes to public health R&D. Um, so we can pivot 
and learn the lessons that we have learned in growing our biotech, life sciences, and public health R&D companies and apply those lessons and principles to grow, to grow a new cluster industry uh, in clean tech and advanced clean um, energy so that we can capture opportunities in the new, on the new horizon. And I um, want to mention a couple of bills that I uh, did um, introduce and passed both House and the Senate. Uh, one was to provide technical assistance to all the SBIR uh, companies who want to capture phase one and phase two federal grants. And these are not loans, these are grants from federal government. And Maryland being home to, you know, uh, a couple of um, federal uh, R&D institutions, we are really, you know, the epicenter of federal R&D assets and unrivaled. Um, so in doing that, the program, of course, will be administered uh, by TETCO. Um, but what I want to say is it's technology agnostic. Um, unlike the past, in the past that we tend to focus as a state heavily on biotech and cybersecurity. Now we are making these programs technology agnostic so clean tech companies can have a shot just like any other companies. Um, and also a second bill is the matching state matching grant so that companies receiving federal phase one and two SBIR grants can get state matching grant to fund the things that the federal government would not be able to fund. Um, and in those bills, we specifically made a point I'm talking about intentional. We specifically said that TEDCO needs to work with the small minority communities and disadvantaged communities so that they would also have an opportunity to expand their growth and access to capital and access to technical assistance. So I think intentionality should cut across everything we do. It's not just those set aside programs. And it, it's our culture shift, a cultural shift that we are thinking of right now. Thank you, Stephen. I know you're going to say something there. Yeah, Anton. I, I just um, just some reflections, I, I suppose, on on some of the programs um, that we either are running or or have run. Um, uh, just to give folks a bit to think about, um, the internship program that I mentioned um, does include community college students as well. Um, but Troy, that has been a tough nut to crack, as you can um, appreciate. Uh, the typical community college student has, frankly, a heck of a lot more going on in their life than uh, your typical four-year student. And so, um, you know, uh, tailoring the program a bit more towards those students is something we've been working on for years. I don't think we quite have the right formula down yet, but that is, that is certainly an area um, of focus. We've also tried to uh, tailor the program for our vocational uh, technical high schools, essentially trade high schools. Um, again, uh, a different uh, set of considerations, um, another, uh, another nut that we haven't quite cracked, but one that we're very, um, that we're very focused on uh, given, I think, some of the opportunities in the trades going forward with all the buildings work um, that we're going to, to uh, need to do. Um, we are trying to uh, uh, sort of realign the at least a portion of our four-year internship uh, program to focus on both students as well as companies that are located in what we refer to in Massachusetts as gateway cities, um, which are some of the you know the smaller cities outside of uh, Boston and the immediate um, metro area. Again, trying to um, you know trying to get at the problem where it really. Uh, where it really lies. That is an effort we're going to actually kick off um, in the spring. And so, um, you know, hopefully a year from now, we'll, we'll start to see some results from that. The last that, um, that I um, would want to mention is I mentioned the offshore wind work that we're doing, uh, the workforce development um, uh, funding and the like. Um, a fair portion of that funding has gone to um, uh, community colleges um, as well as um, some uh, 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 very directed portions to uh, labor unions in order to um, uh, in order to develop capacity um, through certificate programs, through two-year programs, and the like. Um, uh, they can bring those workers, uh, those kinds of workers, um, on board. And our the next round of funding for that is going to be um, uh, very particularly and intentionally focused on. Uh, more equitable access um, to those opportunities. So um, some things that we haven't figured out yet, some things that we're trying, uh, you know, hopefully um, over the course of, of the coming years, we'll, uh, you know, we'll find a, a couple of recipes that, that really work for us. 
I appreciate that. So I've got some questions here to get to. So, uh, you know, maybe this next question, obviously, I think is on the top of a lot of people's minds. And Governor, maybe you can you can take it. Um, do, do you see the current economic health situation regarding COVID-19 significantly holding back the push to more renewables, energy efficiency, and the switch to electric vehicles? Will these technologies be delayed for a year or two, or will they continue to grow at the rate seen over the past few years? I've got my thoughts on this as well. I'm sure a lot of folks do, but maybe Governor, you can maybe respond first. Let's talk about the utility sector and what's happening there. You have now several, and I mean like 20 some major investor owned utilities that have set emissions reduction targets. And they would say the thing that they need to do is take coal offline because it's become non-economic um, in part. And certainly there's the carbon footprint part of it too, but take that offline and then push as much renewables onto the system as they can while it's still in a way that's still reliable and affordable. So that this, this idea about 100% renewables, people don't know how to get there. Um, over the next 10 years in a way that's affordable and reliable, but there's a lot that can still be done in the examples of uh, Maryland, Virginia, North Carolina deciding to commit to big offshore wind is just one example that's happening in the West in solar and wind. And, a, and, and so that's gonna happen. So I don't think in the next 10 years, even with COVID, that we're gonna see a slowdown in that because these utilities have made commitments to it. Their shareholders are pushing them. Some states have policies that are requiring them to do that through portfolio standards. And I think there's every possibility, even uh, a bipartisan bill that's a clean energy standard could be introduced and passed in Congress if the politics change a little bit, we'll see. But those kinds of things are gonna keep that happening. And as it relates to electric vehicles, as utilities try and decarbonize their grid, it makes sense for them to electrify other things, including transportation. And because transportation is now eclipsed the electricity sector in terms of its emissions, there's going to be a great deal of focus put on the transportation sector. And I think we're going to see this push on electric vehicles continue for the next 10 to 15 years in a really significant way. So my sense is no, uh, that it's not going to slow this down because of these other forces requiring this to move in such a significant way. Yeah, and I think I think besides, you know, what we've seen, I, I echo, your, echo your thoughts 100%. When you've got, you know, some of the biggest companies in the world pushing and they're making big policy, you know, they're pushing the policy holders as well. Uh, the Facebooks, the Apples, you know, you can go to Starbucks. You can see all these companies who are going to look to be carbon, you know, um, reduce their carbon emissions. There's just too much of a wave. And I think sometimes I have to take a step back because, the renewable industry, although there's been so much momentum and, and clean and the clean energy industry, it's still such a new industry, right? Compared to obviously traditional fossil fuels. And there is there's is so much momentum. And I, I agree with you. I think, look, I think no matter what, it's going to continue to grow. I will say this not to get too political. I think clearly if there is a change in administration, there is going to be a massive influx of, well, said it's yep. potentially got to change too, uh, of a clean energy plan that, that also will have a big piece of it related to social impact investing that we talked about a little bit earlier. So uh, I think there's, there, you know, we'll continue to grow no matter what, but I think there's, there, there, if there could be game changing things that would happen to the industry, I think for, for many, many years to come, um, I think if there's a change. I would just, I would just add that it, even if it doesn't change, yeah. the things happening at the state level are yeah. so dramatic. Yeah. That I, I think, and I, if it happens at the federal level and there's, you know, complementary movement, um, that's really helpful. But yeah. well, we work with a lot of states that are moving this in a very aggressive way. Yeah. Uh, Troy, okay, go ahead. I was, I was going to say a comment on that from the from the RPE perspective. Like we're we're much further upstream, right? So we are interacting with venture capitalists that are making decisions around starting new companies. There's been a bit of a hiccup, especially for later stage venture investors that are more revenue reliant. Um, but I, I don't think in the long run, I think the early stage investors are still going at it. And I, just to loop back, I wanted to emphasize something regarding kind of what can be done to support innovative new companies that maybe aren't as deployment focused as a lot of the conversation in the last round of questions are, but, yeah. but I think are really important for the organizations like RPE would be spitting out at the back end of its research. And Stephen mentioned it, it's... Um, it's really those incubators and accelerators. Um, I don't know if you mentioned them by name, but Greentown Labs up in uh, up in Boston is a crown jewel of of, uh, of incubation for new technologies, and it's such a valuable resource. And actually, I think Bill, your your office is in a really awesome 
<laughs> incubator as well. So, so the, those are such a valuable resource. If you can find the way to kind of support those and, and stand them up for those early stage researchers that can't afford the overhead associated with a wet lab, or, I mean, like, you know, the permitting, the waste management, I mean, just, and that's just one example, right? That's a, it's a glaring example, but, but that's such a valuable resource for kind of these, these early stage technologies that are just trying to get out into the, you know, out of the, out of the university lab and into like their own actual lab space. So, and James, right. to, to that point, one of the things we, we are doing in Maryland, it's not, it's not just having an incubator, so I, I don't disagree with you, but it's actually having a real wet lab space uh, so it's almost like a we works around labs, and so yeah, we, actually yeah, yeah, yeah. Have, we actually have a number of those concepts in Baltimore um, that, right. that are being developed uh, that allow that type of innovation to happen. And so actually, we're 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 a partner in a number of those efforts here here in Maryland. Very cool. Yeah. So that and by the way, like I guess I don't know where you where you divide the line, right? But like incubators, typically there there's some payment and equity or cash or whatever by that startup. Um, but but just to kind of share that overhead is such a is such a you know, so leveraging for these guys that don't really have the big bucks yet. Anton, this is Kathy. I, I have to jump in. Um, I know we only have a few I, minutes I was, left. I was, I was about to, and I wanted to ask you a question. We still didn't get to, I apologize, three questions and really good questions. So to, I, I certainly want the panel, you know, to circulate these questions and, and, and for them to offer uh, some answers. So how do you suggest we handle those? Well, we'll be happy to do some follow-ups uh, and post those online with the web webinar posting. I just wanna take a quick opportunity to mention the Maryland Energy Innovation Accelerator, which follows along this tr uh, track that is, is being discussed that we launched in 2019 and we've had our first year of working with teams. What we're doing is a little different than Incubator. Um, and I think it's important to understand not every research and development expert wants to build a company. Some of them wanna just keep doing research and development because that's their sweet spot. So what we're trying to do with this investment is wrap executive expertise around the technology to help move that technology to the marketplace and partnering with TEDCO and partnering with the university res uh, resources that are available to help move the technology to the market. It's just a different approach, but it's um, something that Maryland is trying to kick off as part of this initiative. And uh, I wanna give a little credit to Brian Toll and the team at um, Maryland Energy Innovation Accelerator for coming up with this strategy and trying to get it out there in the marketplace. That was my quiet commercial for the work that we've been doing here that, that dovetails with TEDCO and dovetails with the other investments. We're and, that, and that is a great point, Kathy. We see that all the time at RPE. 50% of our projects are at universities, university professors, Get compensated for papers, PhD students, they're passionate about research. Sometimes they're really good entrepreneurs and they spin out companies and they do sabbaticals and they take them forward. The majority of so, time they do not, right? Yeah. And so finding the right finding the right team to take that technology to the next step is a big, big uh, challenge. And it's good that you guys are tackling that. Before we wrap up, Anton, I just wanna say that some of the terms and some of the comments that we heard today were so on time. The idea of intentionality, you know, us making a choice in the country and in the state to say this is the future for our economy and that we're going to get behind it and evidenced by the governor's announcement today, it takes a team, it takes a collaborative approach, the collaboratory term that we heard from Governor Ritter, thank you for that lovely idea, I'm sure that we'll find a way to leverage off that. Um, and then what we heard from Troy on wealth expansion and wealth inclusion um, really important and micro badging. I want to learn more about that too. So there's so much more on this topic to talk about. I know with leadership like Secretary Schultz and and Delegate Chi in the policy and and um, investment arena in our state that will make headway. On behalf of the Maryland Clean Energy Center and our board, I really want to thank all of you for making the time to be part of this very important discussion this morning. I know it won't be the last time this topic will come up. Anton, I want to thank you specifically for arranging to sponsor the series writ large and for moderating a great panel this morning. Yeah. Um, any, I'll close and any last comments the panelists want to make. Thank you so much. Uh, I just want to say I, I learned a great word today, collaboratory, which uh, I was very excited about. So.
Um, but um, no, I think I think Kathy, one thing we should regroup is certainly a couple of topics that came out from what we were talking today. I think we could actually have a separate panel on, um, you know, down the road. Um, so um, definitely something to think about. But uh, certainly on behalf of obviously um, Cohen Resnick and and uh, and me, the um, you know I really appreciate everyone's insights on the panel. And um, you know I think if 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 the, these are the types of folks that are deeply invested and, and devoted to the industry. I think we've got, we've got a lot of great opportunities ahead of us. Um, and I think the, the clean energy space is in really good hands.